Shortly after my personal encounter with the Lord, our unit was sent overseas. We were number one light field ambulance attached to number one armored division. We ne they never told us where they were sending us, and we were nearly two months at sea. We sailed westward almost to a Churchill on his own initiative, then appointed a little-known commander named Montgomery, and uh, we knew nothing about him. Well then, <clears throat> the Battle of El Alamein was fought, and I was somewhere in the rear. The next day, I was listening to a news commentator and a little portable radio on the back, on the tailboard of the truck, and he was giving a description of the preparation of at, at Montgomery's headquarters the night before the battle. And he described how Montgomery came out, addressed his officers and men, and said, let us ask the Lord, mighty in battle, to give us the victory. And when he said that, I don't know if you can understand me, but heaven's electricity went through me from the crown of my head to the soles of my feet. And God said, that's the answer to your prayer. So I have always from that time on believed that God can intervene in history if we know how to pray. At that stage, I developed a skin infection on my feet, for which the doctors offered various names, each one longer than the previous one. And eventually, they just settled with chronic eczema. My, uh, my officers in my unit wanted to keep me with them, but eventually I had to be put in hospital. And I spent almost a year on end in military hospitals in the Middle East. In due course, I was transferred to a place called Albala on the Suez Canal. And there I was visited by a very unusual person, a lady Salvation Army brigadier who had a little ministry in Cairo. Her husband had died and According to Salvation Army regulations, she took her husband's rank, which was a brigadier. She was well up in her 70s and was just about as militant about the baptism of the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues as other Salvationists are about salvation. So God bless her. She's with the Lord and has been for many years. She heard about this soldier sick in, on, at the Suez Canal and she got hold of some vehicle, I don't know how she did it. She got an, an, a, a New Zealand soldier to drive her and she brought with her an American young woman, her co-worker, and they drove, I think it was about 50 miles, to the hospital. Then, fully attired in her bonnet and ribbons and everything, she marched into the ward, overawed the, sister, the nurse, and got permission for me to go out and sit in the car with them and pray. She didn't ask me whether I wanted to do that. So I found myself sitting at the back of this very small four-seater car with the American young lady beside me and the Salvation Army Brigadier and the New Zealand driver in the front seat. We began to pray and this young woman beside me began to vibrate. And I mean, she was vibrating very powerfully and then I began to vibrate and then everybody in the car began to vibrate and then the car itself began to vibrate and it was it, the engine was not running and it was not and I was aware that God was doing something and then this young woman spoke in another tongue and then gave the interpretation and I don't recall anything on the, of the interpretation except this one phrase. Consider the work of Calvary, a perfect work, perfect in every respect and perfect in every aspect. Now I got out of the car just as sick as I was when I got in. But God had shown me the place to look for an answer. What he called the work of Calvary, the atoning sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. And over the years, I've come to see that Jesus, through that sacrifice, provided forgiveness for sin, cleansing from sin, and healing for our physical bodies. 
And I've had my ups and downs at various times, but I have never, never forgotten that whole revelation that came to me. And I'm so overawed by God's mercy that he would take pity on one soldier in a remote hospital and send all that, take all that trouble just to communicate that to me. A military hospital is a rather depressing place anywhere, but I think in Egypt or that part of the world it's even more so. Well, I knew the Lord. I knew I, I could pray. And I just was wondering why I was sick. And uh, I became very depressed. I said to myself, I know if I had faith, God would heal me. The next thing I said to myself was, but I don't have faith. I was reading my Bible faithfully, and one day I read in Romans 10, 17, so then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. And I latched onto that phrase, faith cometh. And I said to myself, if I don't have faith, I can get it. So then I said, well, how does it come? And the answer was, by hearing the word of God. So I decided I'm going to read the Bible through. I had plenty of time from beginning to end, and I'm going to underline certain themes with certain colors. And I chose for healing the color blue. So I started at the beginning of the Bible and read it through, faithfully underlining in blue everything that had to do with healing. You know what I had at the end? A blue Bible. I mean, nothing could ever have convinced me more completely how much healing is a part of God's total provision. But I still had this problem that I was a philosopher. And I mean, the, the training of philosophers is to make simple things difficult. So every time I read healing, I thought, yes, but that's only your soul. God isn't interested in your body, it's just your soul. So I went along and didn't get anything until I got to Proverbs chapter 4, verse 20 and following. My son, attend to my words, incline thine ear unto my saying. Let them not depart from thine eyes, for they are life to those who find them, and health, and the margin said, or medicine, to all their flesh. And I said to myself, that settles it. Not even a philosopher can make flesh mean so. <clears throat> then I saw that the marginal reading was medicine. So I thought to myself, if I'm sick, the Word of God can be my medicine. And being a medical orderly, I said to myself, how do people take medicine? And in those days, it's changed a little now. Normally, it was three times daily after meals. So I decided that's what I would do, take the Bible three times daily after meals as my medicine. After about a couple of months, my condition had considerably improved, but I was not fully healed and I was discharged from the hospital at my own responsibility. I went back to the base depot in Cairo, and about three days later, I was posted to the Sudan. Well, Egypt was an unhealthy climate, but the Sudan was worse. In the Sudan, I had very few options. I had no choice of diet. I had no, really no choice of lifestyle. All I could do was to take the Bible as my medicine three times daily after meal. I was first posted to Khartoum, but after a little while I was sent north up the railway line to a railway junction called Atbara, where there was what they call a reception station, that is a little medical facility with one medical personnel in charge, two beds, some medication dressings, really a stopping stage for people who were being admitted to hospital. So I was put in charge of this reception station at Atbara. And it was something like a luxury for me after my years in the desert, etc. Because uh, there were two beds with mattresses, and they had sheets, and they were for the patients, of course, but there were no patients. So I really indulged myself I, for, for, the last, for the first time for about three years, I didn't sleep in my underwear. I put on one of these flannel nightgowns, slept in a real bed, and I began to get a tremendous burden of prayer for the people of the Sudan, the northern Sudan, who are almost exclusively Muslim, and really had not at that time been evangelized at all. 
In fact, the British government wouldn't permit missionaries in that area because they didn't want to offend the Muslims. And I got this tremendous sense of the need of these people in darkness. And I got out of my bed and I began to walk to and fro, praying with my whole heart. And something really remarkable happened. My white flannel nightgown began to glow. It became really, I think, incandescent is the word. And I realized that there was a special anointing, if you could call it that, of the Holy Spirit giving me intercession for these people. And I mean, they were not easy to love, those people. They were tough, they were unresponsive. But I got such a sense of compassion for them. So then the army soon sent me on to a place called Chibate on the Red Sea, where there was a small military hospital which catered only to Italian prisoners of war, of whom there were thousands at that time. So I ended up as responsible for the Sudani labor and for the rations and the feeding of the hospital. And I had as my assistant a Sudani named Ani. And um, he didn't read or write any language, but he, by mixing with soldiers, he learned what you could call soldier's English. He was very sharp, very intelligent but we didn't have any kind of common ground until one day I discovered he believed in Satan. Well, I said, I believe in Satan too. So that was our meeting point, this common acknowledgement of Satan. Then a little while later, he, he had an appointment with me every day to meet me in my little office and plan the, the work in the hospital. He came late. And when he was late, he apologized and he said he'd been to the clinic in the hospital because he had a sore on his foot. And he showed me the sore because he didn't wear shoes. Well, I knew that the Bible said something about praying for the sick and laying hands on them. And I thought, well, maybe I should do that. I don't think at that time I'd ever seen anybody do it. So I said, would you like me to pray for you? And he said, yes. So, I mean, I treated him like he was a bomb that might explode. And I gently put my hands on him and prayed a rather formal sort of prayer. I thought, that's it. Well, about a week later, he came in as usual. He said, you want to see my foot? So I said, yes. He said, it's completely healed. And so after that, we had another basis for interchange. So I said, well, I'd like to read to you from the New Testament. I don't think he knew what the New Testament was. <clears throat> so we started at John's Gospel, and I read a little passage every day, translating the King James Version into soldier English as I went along. And he became very interested. Well, then we really became friends, and he wanted to teach me how to ride a camel. So we agreed on that. And he got two camels from somewhere, and we would go out riding in the desert. Well, then one day I suggested we take a picnic with our camels because I was in charge of the rations, so I had access to what we needed. So we rode out uh, quite a distance into the desert. By this time I was reading the New Testament to him in soldier's English from John's Gospel. And uh, when we got to where we were going to eat our food, there was a little brackish trickle of water running down the hill. And he said to me, we Sudanese drink this, but you white people don't. Well, I said, I'm willing to drink it if there's nothing else. So he said, why are you different from the other white people? Well, I said, Jesus promised that if I drink anything deadly, it will not hurt me. So I drank it and never suffered anything. And I could see that impressed him. So we had our little meal. And I happened to be reading that day from John chapter 3 about being born again, and I read that. And the, the phrase being born again really gripped him. And he kept talking about it, born again, what's that? So on the way back on the camels, I said, would you like to be born again? He said, yes, I would. Well, I said, listen, this evening when the sun sets, you go to your hut, I'll go to my billet, 
you pray and I'll pray for you and you ask to be born again. So next morning I met him as usual. I said, did you pray? He said, yes. I said, did anything happen? He said, no. And I was disappointed for a moment. But then the Holy Spirit seemed to whisper in my ear, he's a Muslim. I knew very little about Islam at that time. So I said, did you pray in the name of Jesus? He said, no. When I said, if you want to be born again, you have to pray in the name of Jesus. Are you willing to do that? He said, yes. So I said, all right, this evening, you go to your hut, I'll go to my billet. When the sun sets, we pray. Next morning when I met him, I looked at him, and I said, you got it. And I mean, his whole face was totally transformed. And all the people in the hospital that knew him and knew he was my friend, kept saying to me, what's happened to your friend Ali? I said, he got saved. <laughs> they said, what's that? I said, let me explain. The commanding officer at the hospital sent to me, he said, what's happened to your friend Ali? He said, he got saved. So, and really we became very good friends. We were as uh, different as we could be in most things, but a real friendship developed between us. And I do trust the Lord that one day we'll meet in heaven. That was, a, my, I think that was the first person I'd ever really led to the Lord. And of course, in view of my later experiences in the Middle East, I think it was very important. I got to see the gospel works for Muslims, just like anybody else. After a year in the Sudan, I was drafted back to Cairo. And because I'd been three years in deserts, I applied for a more humane posting. And eventually, I was sent to what was then Palestine. So I was posted to a little place called Kiryat Motskin on the shore of the Mediterranean, a little north of Haifa. I had heard about this Danish missionary that had a small children's home a little north of Jerusalem in a place called Ramallah, which was then a small Arab village. And everybody I'd met in the Sudan and in Egypt had said, if you really want a blessing, you need to go to that little children's home. So I got on a number 18 bus from Jerusalem, went out to the children's home, and arrived and found Lydia uh, with uh, eight small girls all around her and uh, I was immediately impressed by the sense of peace which was a very rare thing in the Middle East at that time. We had strict upbringing but she was loving and uh, we were brought up with prayer and faith even I remember as very very young at one time we had no food, and mommy said, come on girls. So we all had to kneel down and pray and ask God to send food. I, I remember it in, exactly now, I can see it. In the morning we opened the door and there was a basket of eggs outside our door and some milk. But we never knew who brought it. So we, it is how we brought up, to believe in that God would supply all your needs, and he did. And he's still doing it, even now. Mm. Uh, mother had a, quite a ministry amongst soldiers because um, there was an, a missionary, she was a um, Salvation Army missionary in Egypt and whenever they had um, leave the soldiers that were in Egypt she would say to them, you've got to go and see Miss Christensen. She has a lovely home with children and, and she would be able to minister to you and quite a lot of them came and Derek was one of them. And uh, she made me very welcome and we prayed together and she gave me tea and so on. So when I got back to Kiryat Motskin, I thought that poor Danish lady, she's got all those children and nobody but an Arab maid to help her and very little money. So I said, I'll pray for her. And I was praying and the Lord spoke to me as he did quite frequently at that time. I would get an utterance in an unknown tongue and then I would get the interpretation. And this time the message I got was, I have joined you together under the same yoke and in the same harness. 
And I thought, that's remarkable. Does that mean we're going to work together? So then I applied for a posting, because I didn't get on well with my commanding officer. And he was glad to get rid of me and recommended the posting. So I ended up, a little while later, in number 16 British General Hospital on the Mount of Olives. And there is where I ended my military career. Being now within easy reach of Ramallah, I began to take fairly regular trips out to the children's home. And one day I spoke to Lydia and I said, on the basis of what the Lord had said to me, I said, I believe God would have us to work together. And her reply was characteristic. She said, well, he'll have to work on both ends of the chain. However, I really became more and more attached to the children's home and to Lydia. And it was like, as you could say, an oasis in the middle of a dreary military career. At that time, Lydia had relatively little fellowship with other Europeans or other non-Palestinians. So I, my visits were very welcome. And uh, we used to read the Bible and pray together. And uh, eventually I, decided, I felt that God wanted me to be part of that children's home, which is the most...